Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's study session. It's 545. We'll begin this study session. And uh, Mr. Tice, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mayor. I guess you're this is on. You're on. We members, can hear you. members of Council. So this evening, I wanted to uh, take a little time to bring the City Council up to date on our current uh, uh, general plan. As you uh, are probably aware, the state statute requires that cities update and reapprove their general plan every 10 years. So in Casa Grande's case, our 2020 plan, as we call it, was approved by city council and um, by the voters in 2009. So it's time to uh, revise and reaffirm and approve a general plan. As you'll see, we've been working on this project diligently for about the last nine months. Um, it's been a real collaborative effort between planning staff, our uh, consultant, our primary consultant, uh, Planet, with Leslie Dornfeld, and Leslie's here in the audience this evening, along with her subconsultants of AECOM, and our uh, technical advisory committee and our steering forum, and also the general public input that we've received. So it's been a real collaborative effort. Everyone has contributed. We're currently at the 60-day uh, review stage, which means that the draft of the plan is completed and it's been distributed out to various agencies um, and organizations for a formal 60-day public review. I know that each of you uh, received an email with a link to the electronic version of it, I think back in September, as well as a hard copy. So uh, hopefully, uh, I know that you probably have all read it and know everything in the plan, but I thought this evening I'd take a few minutes just to uh, talk about some of the differences between our current general plan and our newly proposed general plan. As you can see on the list, uh, these are some of the processes that the plan has gone through starting way back in May with the City Council's adoption of a public participation plan that laid out the process we were gonna use for soliciting public input into the plan. We were lucky enough to have a large public kickoff meeting in January before the COVID restrictions hit and it was well, uh, well attended. Um, the, the timing was, was really good uh, because we could not do that today. The, uh, we have previously briefed the planning commission early on in the process and briefed city council early on back in March. Uh, we uh, reviewed this with the youth commission. Uh, we put up a general plan website that allowed the public to view our progress as well as to make input along the ways. I mentioned the technical advisory committee. They did meet 11 times and the steering forum met 12 times through this process. The technical advisory committee was represented by um, every city, uh, every city department. You can see the list on the uh, on the screen, as well as various other public agencies and organizations. They have some role to play in planning and development in Casa Grande. This uh, this group. Uh, worked very hard on providing lots of technical information that helped inform the plan, and uh, various members of this these, uh, committee actually wrote elements of the plan, such as the transportation element um, and other uh, technical input. We also had a steering forum that was uh, that you appointed, a kind of, sort of a broad-based community group that represented various stakeholders in the community. The, uh, the mayor chaired that group. Councilman Powell was a member of the group as well. So uh, we had council representatives and representatives of every major stakeholder uh, group that we could identify in the community. The general plan uh, has various elements and we're gonna talk about some of those and some of the contents of those elements, but is. You know, one of the things that are sort of the foundation of the plan is the land use element. It's the, probably the section, the element that we use in planning office on a daily basis, planning commission uses, uh, and city council uses on a regular basis to make land use decisions and help to guide us. 
So you can see the various land use categories that are in this new general plan. They're all the same as the existing categories with the exception, uh, with two exceptions. One is we've introduced a new downtown land use category and we'll be talking about that a little bit more. And we've combined the rural and agriculture categories into the rural. This element does contain a land use map, also a section on accommodating growth and a section on future annexations that we should be thinking about. This is the land use map itself. Uh, the, uh, you can see the new downtown um, in the middle. That's the new downtown core. There's a blow up that, of that later in the presentation. I'll be talking about that a little bit more. And there's also an expansion of the industrial area that I'll be talking about um, as well. So those are the most significant changes to the land use map. In a minute, you're gonna see that the amount of land in each of these categories stayed essentially the same. The distribution was changed a little bit uh, based on appropriate um, decisions on what the appropriate land uses should be and are today. The other elements in the general plan are listed here. All of these are mandatory elements under the state statute with the exception of economic development and historic preservation. Those two elements are optional elements. They were in our prior uh, general plan and the, it was decided to continue to include those in this general plan as they're important to the community. Uh, the historic preservation element was essentially developed by the Historic Preservation Commission. And the economic development uh, was driven uh, significantly by our economic development department. This general plan is broken up into three general themes one called growing economy, the other is enhancing quality of life, and the other is environmental sustainability. There are different elements that we've grouped under those, these themes, you can see those on the, on the screen that, that relate to one another. The, the name of the plan, the, the branding of it, if you will, was a growing horizon, which really relates back to uh, the growing economy and of Casa Grande. When we started this process, there was a lot of discussion about what changes might need to be made to the existing 2020 general plan. And I think the general consensus was that the existing general plan was, uh, had, was fundamentally sound. It was a good plan, had good bones, but it needed some revisions around the edges to address some emerging community issues that weren't necessarily significant issues when the 2020 plan was Created. And those issues are listed here. The, the first is really that we have limited water resources to support growth and development. Uh, how is that going to change how we're planning our community? The desire to promote infill of vacant land that could be easily served by existing infrastructure and city services. The need to expand housing choices to accommodate all levels, all income levels and demographics. The desire to bring new activity and development into the downtown area and to drive growth through the creation of new quality commercial industrial development as well as well-paying job. So with these community issues, um, the, we created what are known as the founding principles um, for the plan. These, they kind of morphed into these uh, founding principles that helped really drive what the plan was going to be and where it was going to go. Um, they all, I'm going to talk about some of these a little bit more detail for in later on in the presentation, so I won't go into those in detail, but I will say that uh, pretty much every change that was made to the general plan was made to implement one of these founding principles. And I'm pretty, I think we discussed these early on in the process um, because they were all kind of formulated before we really delved into rewriting the plan. So a synopsis maybe of the major changes between the 2020 and 2030 plans are, uh, it includes an evaluation of growth projections uh, relative to water resource availability. We're gonna talk about that in some detail in a moment. We created a new downtown land use category in an effort to facilitate downtown development 
uh, th that kind of keyed off the, uh, the Urban Land Use Institute uh, uh, charrette we had downtown and that, that, um, that discussion where uh, many of those same concepts that th that technical team uh, suggested have now been incorporated into the plan. Uh, to provide, we've provided additional opportunities for middle density housing in the land use category to improve housing choices. In the planning jargon, this is called the missing middle. It's uh, nationwide, there's a lack of medium density housing, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. Also, we combine the rural and agriculture uh, land uses into one land use category because the, the vision between those is essentially the same. Um, and um, I, I think it just makes more sense to have one large category versus two. We had to expand the amount of land in the manufacturing and industrial land use category. I'll talk about that a little bit later. But uh, we, we realized that we only had enough land currently identified in manufacturing and land use to meet our need for about the next 30 years. And you really want to have more land available that you need. And so we had to increase that. Uh, there should be no surprise. Uh, given the amount of manufacturing and industrial development we've been doing over the last you know, eight to five years. And lastly, we consolidated the growth areas from four into two. This pie chart shows you the uh, amount of land in each of those land use categories in the 2020 plan versus the 2030. I mentioned that there really was not much change in the amount of land. This, this pie chart sort of uh, brings home that point. A little bit of reduction in neighborhoods, uh, increase in the rural um, and ag, the uh, a little bit of uh, of uh, increase in the community corridor, but not overall, not much real change. Just so you know, the uh, this represents the planning area. Uh, the uh, excuse me, this represents the uh, the the city limits. There. The city limits has 100 square miles. The planning area has 200 square miles. So the distribution looks different. If I looked at the planning area, because that's the area outside of the city, there's much more rural in the planning area. It's like 46% is rural. So, but this is the city limits itself. So the first guiding principle I just want to talk a little bit about was to link all land use decisions to the known available water resources to ensure long-term viability and sustainability for all growth and development. The actual statute uh, for general plans requires a water resource element that we provide one, and it specifically requires us to look at three aspects of water resource. First, to identify the known legally and physically available uh, water that in both surface, groundwater, and effluent supplies that we have available. And two, to look at how much water we need to accommodate our growth projections. And lastly, to look at that relationship of the water resource needed to meet our to serve our growth projections or projected growth and how much we have available and if there's a gap between those two numbers to look at how we can close that gap, how we can deal with it. So that's the statute requirement and hopefully I, I think we did a pretty good job of looking at all three of those. So the first thing we really looked at is, well, how much water are we really using in Casa Grande? And so Arizona Water, who's the primary water provider for us, shared their data to me they have how much water they've been serving to Casa Grande over the last 10 years. If you look at this graph, it's about 15,000 acre feet uh, per year for, for the last uh, nine or 10 years. The really interesting thing about this graph is that our population has actually increased 12% during that same time. I would have assumed to see the water usage increase about by 12%, but it in fact hasn't. It's been pretty, pretty, stamp, pretty level, right? Pretty constant. So the, uh, the reason that I believe that that's occurred is because we're being better at conserving water and uh, both our businesses and our residents are using less water per capita uh, than they had prior over the time period. So that's a really good trend. And uh, I guess we need to continue to, uh, to focus on that trend and to emphasize it. You're going to see that our population projection uh, for the next 30 years is to essentially double our population from 60,000 to about 120,000. 
those are the numbers that, uh, that were generated by the state demographer's office. We actually had two other sources of population projection, one done by uh, my office, and as well another one done by the Maricopa Area Council of Governments, and all three projections were essentially very close uh, together, um, and so we decided as a group to use the state demographer. So if you think about the population doubling over the next 30 years, logic would tell us that our water consumption, unless we intervene in some way, is gonna also double. And so you would see it's gonna go from 15,000 acre feet to 30,000 acre feet. That's essentially how much water that we need uh, to support our growth. You're gonna also see that uh, one of our goals in, the, uh, in this element is to actually try to increase conservation and reduce that consumption by about 15% uh, per capita over the next, uh, over the time period here. To continue those conservation efforts to, uh, to drive the water usage per person uh, in households and by businesses down to use less water. We still are gonna be needing about 25,000 acre feet uh, per year um, by 2050. So what's, what's uh, some of the more details on what's driving that water usage is, you know, the, the biggest component of water usage is residential, um, specifically single family homes. That's the biggest user of water. This chart tells us that if we are going to uh, increase our population, basically double it, um, we are going to essentially double the number of housing units that we have in the community. Today we have about 22,000, uh, a little over 22,000 housing units, and by 2030 we're going to have close to 45,000. So we're going to essentially double the number of housing units over the next 30 years. So if we're going to have about uh, population growth for the next 30 years is about 61,000. It's essentially doubling what we have today. It's about where we are. We're gonna need about 22,000 new dwelling units to support that additional population. Today I'm gonna tell you that about 90% of, 85 to 90% of our new dwelling units are single family detached. Um, as you probably know, that's, you have lots of single-family detached homes being constructed in the community. You have some manufactured home parks being constructed, and you have very few apartments uh, being constructed. Uh, our housing element and our housing expert uh, tells us, Rick Elliott from Pollock and Company, tells us that really what we should be having is more of a, of a, of a ratio of about 70% single-family, 15% apartments, townhomes, condos, and 15% manufactured homes and park models. So the trend of, of, of so much single family, we think, will be slowly um, changed with the introduction of more apartments, condos, townhomes. Um, we think manufactured home parks won't increase. They're technically about 15% of the total today, uh, but the real growth will be in apartments, condos, and townhomes. So if you look at the uh, additional, at 22,000 new dwelling units, and if you assume 70% of them need to be single family homes, you come up with the number that you need about 15,000 or so new single family homes to accommodate the growth over the next 30 years. Uh, and the addition, uh, the, the remainder of the units, uh, 6,600 will be met by apartment units, manufactured homes, condos, townhomes. So that's what we need to know. Do we have enough water to support 15,000 new single family homes and 6,600 new apartments and condos? Can, Are we in the can, water? Can, okay, yes, we're on water. water. So to answer that question, uh, we looked at how many certificates of assured water supply do we have out there that have been issued and not used? So we went into the ADWR database. We, we, we were able to obtain information on all of the certificates of assured water supply that have been issued. And, uh, and then we looked at the vacant lots and we mapped where they are. And here's what we found. You can see that in gen we have about 21,800 vacant lots with certificates of assured water supply. Uh, the interesting thing about that is that um, 
The majority of those certificates are associated with preliminary plats. We have final plats, which are being built on today, um, but the Arizona Department of Water Resources issued certificates of assured water supply for preliminary plats as well. So that's, so we have a lot of preliminary plats um, that have come through, partially through the system. They have to come back to council's final plats and get approval. Uh, the other thing that we found out that was interesting that I really didn't know is that there's over 3,000 condo sites that have, have certificates of assured water supply. So, and those are distributed throughout the community too in different lo locations. So in fact, we can build new townhomes and condos and sell them because they do have certificates of assured water supply. So our summary of that data was that uh, Casa Grande, in fact, does have enough vacant lots approved with cause to meet the projected population growth in single family home construction and town, town home and condo construction over the next 20 to 30 years. The reason why it's 20 to 30 is all depends on how many you know, we're, units we're building per year. If I stood here making this presentation six months ago, I would tell you that we're doing you know, 500 to 750 um, homes per year. Today, I'm gonna to tell you that we're gonna do between 1,000 and 1,200 per year. So the rate of growth has really increased over the last you know, six months. Whether or not that's sustainable, I don't know. But, so, but somewhere between 20 and 30 years, um, we have enough supply of vacant lots with assured water supply certificates to meet our demand. What that also tells me, though, is that we need to be thinking in the future about what, how we, what do we do to sustain growth and development beyond that time frame. Because it's likely that, um, you know, whether or not ADWR decides that there's actually more water in the basin than, than they think there is today, that's an unknown. I, if I had to guess, I'm going to guess that they're not going to reverse their position. So what does that mean we need to do? We need to reduce our reliance on groundwater. We need to invest in sustainable water supplies, and we need to use the water that we have more efficiently. The water resource element of the general plan goes into specific goals and, uh, and action steps that implements those premises. Um, again, to implement water conservation me measures to reduce outdoor use of water, that's the big user, is actually outdoor rec uh, irrigation, specifically with single-family homes, um, to reduce the daily water per capita by 15 percent, uh, to use maximize the use of effluent as an alternative to groundwater in appropriate applications, and to develop additional water supplies to reduce the dependency on groundwater from the Pinal AMA. Mayor, is it okay if I just continue and take questions and comments at the end? That's fine. Is that okay? Yeah, no, if that's yeah. what you're It's doing. a long presentation. I want to make sure I get through it and give you all the information there. Thank you, Paul. Okay, so the other guiding principle that uh, we used in the development of the plan was to encourage development in Casa Grande's downtown to strengthen existing businesses and add further vitality to the downtown area. So we created a series of goals and action steps that we thought that would actually uh, implement that strategy. <clears throat> one of them, uh, and I think it's a really big one, is to focus on residential development opportunities and to provide, a, to provide an alternative urban living choice. So if you think about the downtown, the downtown is one of those few areas of the city where people can actually live and, and walk to work in the industrial area ride their bike to work in the industrial area, the industrial area, and all the jobs that we're creating in the industrial area are probably, you know, two to two miles or so from the downtown. It's a pretty short commute. Um, could work well with transit as well. Uh, the downtown has a grocery store and many other uh, businesses that can support um, folks who are living downtown. And an introduction of residential, new residential in the downtown area would you know, do nothing but strengthen those kinds of businesses. The downtown does have some challenges to development, uh, specifically our current landscape, stormwater management, and parking codes don't do a very good job of acknowledging the unique nature of downtown. Um, 
And so we need to revise those codes to just, you know, not treat downtown like it's normal greenfield suburban kind of development, but it's more urban. So, and, and every community does that. We just haven't really done that in Casa Grande, distinguish the downtown development from other development. One of the goals is to develop a strategy for downtown development, redevelopment, and adaptive reuse. Uh, create really strong people first street design that emphasizes sidewalks and um, interface between the public and the stores and you know, eating areas and alternative transportation as well. And lastly, to preserve and adapt existing structures and historic assets that tie downtown to its agricultural and railroad routes. We have a, a very interesting downtown, has a lot of history to it. We don't want to lose that, but we want to try to bring more vibrancy and development activity there. So one of the ways that we, uh, this plan tries to do that was by creating a new downtown land use category. Uh, as we created the new downtown land use category, and, and I'm going to tell you, we looked really closely at both Chandler's downtown and the Gilbert downtown and the transformation that they've gone through in the last, you know, 10 years, and we, we thought that they was a really good success stories, frankly. But as we looked at our downtown, one of the things that came to mind was that really there's not very little vacant land to develop in our downtown area. That meant that development was going to have to either tear down uh, existing buildings and build new or just to rehab and renovate existing structures. So what this plan did though was to try to add some vacant ground to the downtown. So the downtown core, as you can see here, has been expanded to the west and to the south along both uh, basically Choo Choo Highway as an entry to the downtown from the south and to uh, um, Gila Bend. The addition of that vacant land to the downtown allows for the development of new um, development in downtown, whether it be residential uh, or commercial. But we could get some new construction to complement the existing uh, historic and uh, downtown fabric that we have today. Another guiding principle was to increase the range of housing choices and products available to all sectors of the Casa Grande community. I mentioned to you that you know today, the um, today we most of our housing development is single family detached, like the picture on the left. Um, we do have some multifamily, like the picture on the right, but we don't have much of this middle density housing, which is the picture in the middle. Uh, which is kind of townhomes, condos. Uh, some of it is actually single family detached um, at a little higher density where people uh, will rent some ownership, some rental, a combination of both. I'm gonna go back one slide here. So we developed a series of goals to try to achieve the, the vision of increasing housing choices, to provide a variety of housing choices for all income levels, generations, household demographics, to encourage variety in neighborhood design and development, to encourage higher density in areas designated as the downtown core. We talked about putting more housing in the downtown core, but also in our community corridor and actually in, in even in our commerce and business land use categories. To be sure though that we are, when approving new developments, that we ensure compatibility uh, of our new higher density developments when they're adjacent to residential areas. We've been doing that, as you, if you recall, as we have lots of zone changes, we impose conditions of record, for example, to limit height, increase landscape buffers, those kinds of things when we have use to use compatibility issues. The code talks about formalizing that a little more to increase the supply of affordable and attainable housing, increase home ownership opportunities for low income residents, and to strive to meet the needs of senior citizens and other special need populations. All really good goals. Um, so how we did that uh, within the context of the plan itself is we actually modified the neighborhood's land use category to allow the development of medium density housing with a max 10 DUs per acre, as well as the current higher density housing, which is 
20 DUs per acre. So today we allow higher density housing in our neighborhoods under certain restrictive uh, criteria. The proposal is to also, in addition to the higher density, to allow medium density housing. Max size of the site is 25 acres. And the medium and high density residential components of the neighborhood area cannot constitute more than 20% of the area, which means it's still 80% single family, uh, predominantly single family, but introducing a few more choices into the neighborhoods category. In addition to the neighborhoods, uh, to allow housing in the downtown area, we talked about that, to modify our community corridor land use category to allow housing, residential housing with 25 DUs per acre, a little bit higher density, and to allow multifamily housing in the commerce and business category as well at even a little bit higher density. They would allow us introducing the, those kinds of housing into our commercial corridor, or excuse me, our community corridor, and our commerce and business allows those areas to become more like mixed use, sort of like the downtown. And so there would be mix, mixing of apartments with, uh, with residential. You might think, you know, the promenade, right? Could you build an apartment complex in the promenade? Yes, you probably could, and it probably would be successful, and it probably would work quite well. Our current codes uh, might not allow that, or our current general plan might not allow that. <coughs> rural heritage was another guiding principle to honor and preserve the rural and agricultural heritage of Casa Grande while allowing urbanization to occur in appropriate locations. So we acknowledge the rural heritage and how that is very important to Casa Grande and needs to continue. Uh, we do have a series of goals related to rural preservation. You can see those on the, uh, on the screen. Actually, we had a lot of goals for preserving rural character. Um, I think the, and many of those were very similar to the goals that we have today in our current general plan. The, the one that's a little different was to, um, the second one, which is to explore the city's potential and capacity for solar industry development. Um, you can see the, the slide on the left, which shows you a, uh, a solar field um, in basically a rural or agricultural area. Today, under our current general plan, so utility level solar, fields like this, um, whether or not they're PV or, or wind turbines, are restricted to our industrial areas. The thought process was that's really not a good use of industrial land that has water and wastewater infrastructure because these are low infrastructure uh, users. Uh, the infrastructure they really need is, is high power, high voltage electrical transmission lines. So we thought that it's a good use to potentially allow in the rural category. Um, we would, of course, through the public process and zoning, uh, make sure that there was a compatibility. But from an infrastructure standpoint, it seemed like it's a good potential alternative use for some of the rural land, especially that that has no water rights, that's fallow, and uh, cannot be developed for actual um, farming or agricultural production. So we combine the rural and ag categories into one. I mentioned that that category represents about 7% of the land within the city limits, but represents 46% of the land within the planning area boundary. The land uses that might occur in that rural um, include low density residential development, uh, like one, at one DU per acre, um, maximum density. Uh, as I think about that, I think about the development that's east of the interstate, north of McCartney Road, those kinds of low density residential developments. Um, and, and even lower. Um, under You don't need, for example, a certificate of assured water supply for um, a parcel that's over 36 acres. Uh, so you can certainly do 36 acre parcels uh, for residential development. The, uh, um, also, it allows farming and ranching, both for personal and commercial, just like it does today. And the new one, which we've introduced, is the potential for utility level solar. 
Another guiding principle is that community growth should be driven by high paying quality jobs associated with industrial, corporate office, professional service, financial service, research and development, and other similar developments. You know, I think we, we've done a great job as of late with our economic development activities. It seems to be the major driver of growth and development in this community versus being a bedroom community. I think it really sets Casa Grande apart from a lot of other communities to sort of grow your own jobs and grow your own growth. This, this plan suggests that we should continue doing that. Um, has a series of, of goals to uh, try to continue with that trend. I think, and we actually looked at the, both the, um, the economic development uh, strategic plan and the city council strategic plan in developing many of these, of these goals. In addition to the industrial development, there's a, there's a uh, guiding principle to support our position as the commercial center of Pinal County. We are, are the commercial center of Pinal County and uh, we, we, the plan advocates for that to continue. In terms of manufacturing and industrial land use, I did mention that we it did expand that area. What we found is that, we, what we did is we looked at how much land we had in, currently in the city in each land use category, and then we projected out 30 years how much land we would need in that category uh, based on our current trends and in, in the data that we had available to us. And what it showed us in the manufacturing and industry category was that at the end of 30 years, we would have consumed all our manufacturing and industry classified property. So that's within the city. So that showed us that there was a need to expand that amount of land. There really was not much room for expansion of that within the city itself. So we looked at expansion into the planning area, uh, which of course, that's what the planning area is for, is to allow, <coughs> excuse me, future growth. <coughs> so we expanded it south of, uh, of the Gila Bend Highway. We've extended it south of Selma down towards the eight and on the little bit to the uh, east and south as well of the current uh, um, industrial area. It's all contiguous to the existing uh, industrial area and it expands at the, uh, into the uh, area that needs to be annexed. It's in our planning area, it would need to be annexed uh, but it all looks to be able to have infrastructure uh, provided to it with uh, relatively easily. One of the other emerging community issues that I talked about was the, the fact that we needed to, to do more infill. As this area photo shows, um, we have lots of little vacant sites throughout the community. Um, this is one around um, um, Treckle and, uh, and, and, uh, it's by Lowe's. Oh, so Lowe's, Lowe's, sorry, Mayor. It's Pier. Yeah, yeah Lowe's Pier. And, and Thank Palm you, Mayor. Beach. Yes, Pier and, and Florence. Lowe's so, so, um, we have lots of vac vacant infill sites that have infrastructure, all the infrastructure adjacent to them for development, the road infrastructure, the water, the sewer, um, it makes perfect sense from a city fiscal standpoint to encourage development of these sites because it costs us very little additional increment to provide those services to those. Um, and so it's beneficial to the city, it's beneficial to developers because they have less uh, development cost. So we created a series of goals to uh, help facilitate infill, um, encourage and promote developers to utilize infill sites, direct growth uh, to areas which provide the most sustainable, efficient, cost-effective use of infrastructure. And this one is on Treckle, this photo here. Um, and to uh, maybe uh, most importantly, to consider revision of the impact fee structure to encourage infill development that requires little or no extension of infrastructure or city services. The state law actually allows us to do, do that. We haven't done that, but I think that's something we need to consider to help try to promote infill development. Um, as well.
We also looked at redevelopment to improve neighborhood appearance, living conditions, overall quality of life in the city's older neighborhoods through the preservation and revitalization of residential and commercial areas. I think the Casa Grande Mall is a perfect example of that. Um, to bring new life to that, it, it probably needs some new land uses. Um, we've actually talked to the owner of that about maybe you know, introducing apartments there, for example, and, and some other land uses. But we need to think creatively as we redevelop, uh, to redevelop some of those areas. We do have a series of goals and action steps. Um, um, you can see there, um, one is, you know, to revitalize commercial developments in older neighborhoods. And on the left, you can see a really, a good success story of a renovation of a historic and older building to the Landmarks Event Center. And on the, on the right, excuse me, and on the left, you can see uh, a building that has a lot of potential for renovation and adoptive reuse, which is the uh, Casa Grande Hotel owned by us. We did map out the uh, neighborhood strategy areas and redevelopment areas. You can see them there. We added the one that's on Florence. Um, um, that's not one that we had identified before that does pick up the Casa Grande Mall and some of the other developments along Florence that really uh, should be um, our potential for, for reuse and renovation. And we've mapped the uh, opportunity zones that provide uh, federal tax uh, incentives for development as well. <laughs> Another uh, guiding principle is to create a sense of arrival at our major entryways, cultivate a unique sense of place throughout the community. One of the ways we are advocating that we do that is through our community corridor land use category, which creates little <coughs> development nodes, uh, mixed use uh, areas, um, and so we've strategically put those at the entryways, various entryways, including this one on North Pinal, as well as um, in our corridors, not only Pinal, Florence, but also some of Cottonwood and some of Treckle to try to uh, uh, facilitate a certain type of development uh, character in those areas. You could see the goals here that, we, uh, what, that we're looking at. Those are the ones I discussed with you. Um, in those areas. We uh, have some two guiding principles regarding managing growth. Uh, one's to ensure that essential infrastructure is available concurrent with new development, and two, to plan for growth that allows the city to provide urban services in an efficient and fiscally uh, responsible manner. Today's general plan has four growth areas. We're not introducing a new concept here with growth areas. We have four today, but the new general plan takes it down to two. Um, interesting thing about, we have phase one and phase two. Phase one uh, basically has the ability to either has infrastructure available to it or can be readily um, be brought to it. The interesting thing about phase one is phase one area has enough vacant land to more than accommodate all the growth we need in the next 30 years. Uh, there's that much vacant land in phase one. Probably half of phase one's still vacant after 30 years. That's where all the certificates of, of assured water are too, right, Paul? Yes, and so there you go. The devil. Nice segue, Mayor, thank you. <laughs> this, the other thing in phase one is when we mapped all those subdivisions that have assured water, certificates of assured water, every one of them is in phase one. Um, we made sure of that, and so that's where, the re that's where the residential growth is going to occur until something different happens with how we allocate water in the, in the state. We also looked at multimodal transportation. Uh, Duane Attell, our traffic engineer, along with his consultants from Wilson and Company, uh, essentially wrote this element for us, uh, uh, did a nice job but the guiding principles to foster a land use pattern that can be served by a variety of transportation modes, such as walking, bicycling, uh, autonomous vehicles, ma and mass transit, and normal vehicles. Uh, you can see some, some photos here of some of the things that, you know, we're, we really wanna focus a little bit more on multimodal um, to provide sort of just like in housing, additional housing choices, additional transportation choices, same kind of concept because uh, there's not a one-size-fits-all in the community. 
We do have the uh, planned roadway network uh, that was updated um, and that comes out of our small area transportation plan. One of the things that was decided not to put on this map was the I-11 corridor because that preferred corridor has not yet been determined by ADOT as it passes through Casa Grande, although we, we're still advocating for the Montgomery Road alignment to be used, and it is shown as an expressway here, the I-11 corridor is not specifically called out. We're required to look at transit as part of the general plan, and so we incorporated the currently approved or um, adopted transit network that council um, recently was, um, was uh, briefed on and adopted. So that's in there. We also need to include trails and bicycle network. We did uh, use our existing trails plan and that's in here. Well, we modified it slightly to identify the trail corridors that we have constructed since the last uh, general plan. But we still have a lot of work to do. So that takes me to um, what happens from here. So tonight I'm here to listen, after being brief, listen to your comments and input. Um, take those to, to back to the drawing board if we need to. Um, tomorrow night, we're actually doing a uh, essentially the same briefing to the general public on, uh, on both um, a Zoom meeting, YouTube, and Facebook Live, and Channel 11. So we're doing it for three hours tomorrow night. Um, and so we're gonna try to brief the general public. It's kind of a challenge in these days with COVID, with social distancing, but we're gonna use the online avenues to brief the public, take input and, uh, and comments as well. The plan is going back to the steering forum to talk to the steering forum about all the changes that might uh, have been made between the, this draft and the final draft and the input we received. We're gonna to go to planning commission with a special meeting on November 19th that we're hopefully gonna hold at the community rec center. Um, it's, a, it's required to be a public meeting by state statute and the planning commission is required to hold two public hearings uh, at two different locations. So the second planning commission public hearing would be here at their, in this room on December 3rd at their normal meeting at what time the planning commission would vote on what recommendation to forward to city council. City Council would hold a public hearing on the plan on December 21st, uh, and then on January 4th, you would consider it for formal adoption and scheduling for the public vote. By law, the public vote has to occur uh, about 120 days after your, 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 uh, your decision, so the public vote would be scheduled for a special election on May 18th, which probably would be a mail-in uh, election. With that, I'd uh, be happy to uh, take any questions. Mary? I, I have like about three and I'll try and do it. First of all, I love the term attainable housing. I hadn't heard that before. That's a great, that's a great term. Um, I love the idea that we're looking at rural heritage in the plan, that's, that's a huge. Really wanna beef up our gateways. That's our, you know, that's the first look at our community. and. Those looked really nice out there when they were first constructed, but I think we need something like four times that size. To the question is, first question is, you speak of middle density. Can you give me a little bit of a definition on middle density? Sure. First off, in terms of just density itself, um, our single family detached is built up to about 4.5 DUs per acre. So that's what our single family detached is built at. That, that equates to lot sizes that are like 6,000 feet, square feet and larger. So middle density by definition is something between 4.5 DUs per acre and 10 DUs per acre. So that's the actual density range. Now what does that product look like? It can look like lots of different things. It can look like a um, um, build for rent projects, which is the single family homes that are built on a big one lot owned by one person, one developer, and they're not built for sale, they're built just to be rentals as alternative to renting apartments. Okay. In fact, you, you, know, you will see those in the near future, I'm sure, uh, because there's developers you know, 
discussing constructing them in Casa Grande, uh, but our code doesn't really provide very many good sites for where they, that might happen. Middle density housing may be, may be townhomes, um, you, you know, maybe you know, townhomes that are for sale, that are attached units, they could be single story townhomes, they could be two story townhomes. Um, you know, we do have some historical townhome developments that in Casa Grande, like uh, the Tierra Palmas kind of thing, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of middle density. That is middle density, Tierra Palmas, if you think about it. it um, and it's kind of was really creative for its day, but we haven't built anything like that recently. So we would be encouraging attached, could be detached with smaller lots, more common area um, for both ownership and for uh, rental. And then as far as uh, when you talk about, you had the numbers for detached and then you had apartments and then park models. Mm -hmm. Under the apartment condo townhouse, would that include also the semi-detached? You had shown us a product a few months ago that was uh, where it was like maybe two units with a common wall. Yes, it would. That would okay. be in the middle density housing. Yes, absolutely. Okay. And then I like your idea of, of restructuring the fee schedule to encourage that infill. I think that would make a huge difference. In fact, I think that would attract local uh, investment. I think we have people in our town or surrounding areas that if we did that, they would definitely look at maybe uh, doing something, getting involved in something like that. So that would be something. Okay, thank you. Matt? Yeah, thanks. Uh, I'm not going to echo a lot of what Councilwoman Corson said. It was great. Um, but the water, uh, I'll defer to Mr. Powell too. He knows a lot about it. We went through this recently with a piece of land where we could only do either apartments or, or uh, you know, mobile home manufactured home subdivisions. And we don't have much control over that as a city, right? Because that's a state, a state thing. So we're going to push people towards where we have water. Because if someone owns a piece of land and they want to develop it, they're very limited if they don't have any water. And I've heard of a couple more pieces in town recently that don't have the certificate of assured water. So just to be clear, it's not the city that controls that part of it. That's the state. You're right, Councilman Herman. It is the state. It's their uh, requirement for new subdivisions, any subdivision to have a certificate of assured water supply. All of those in Casa Grande have no new ones have been issued for four years, right? So we, it is, we have what we have right now. And it's 21,000 of them, which is great. Uh, but there's lots of vacant parcels out there uh, that are general plan for neighborhoods and residential development that don't have them. Right. And so one of our challenges is going to be, what do we do with that property? Because there's a lot of it. Um, when I mentioned that you know, in 30 years, only half of that phase one area is gonna develop, that's why some of that can't develop residentially unless we approve it for apartments, um, you know, rental product of some type or, or commercial, right, or industrial. Um, so that is a big challenge. Because, yeah, that's part of the plan is the percentages, which I liked that mm -hmm. good breakdown, yeah. but we can't put all mobile home parks or all, you right. know, uh, re rental properties. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, and when you did the downtown development area and you extended it down south, I would say mostly, mm -hmm. did you speak with the landowners down there about that? We, or? we haven't spoken to the landowners, no. Okay. In, in general, we, you know, because first off, their current zoning doesn't change, right? So we're not taking away any development rights they might have. So they get to develop under their current zoning if that's what they want to do. This really just um, looks at future, future zoning okay. changes, so it, right? It, it, okay. Yeah, it gives them more options, right, Paul? I'd say in general, it definitely gives them more options, yeah. yes. And if you think about it, again, talking about the gateway, that's an important yeah. gateway coming yes. in there. Yeah. And to create an entryway to our downtown from that area, I think would be really beneficial. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. I just wanted to make sure, but that's a good point, Mayor. It expands their opportunities mm -hmm. rather than hinders it. And then the solar on the non water ground in rural areas, because I remember when Governor Brewer came here years ago and she wanted us to be the solar capital of yeah. Arizona, and that doesn't create long-term jobs, just yeah. construction jobs. Um, but if we have land without water and someone wants an opportunity on that land, that's a great, uh, you know, it's not a bad option for them because we're limited. And it, it is important, uh, I like to point for Casa Grande to be the manufacturing industrial hub of Pinal County, and I'm glad we identified that in, in this plan. And lastly, um, I am gonna repeat something that Mary said because I have experience with this recently, is I really like the idea of reducing the impact fees or helping somehow with the infill areas because that has sunk 
or canceling committing small projects on mm -hmm. those infills because if you have to put a thirty thousand dollar water line or twelve thousand dollar or something, I mean that makes it almost impossible for a small lot like that. But that's a great way that we have that we can encourage those. So I uh, thank you for that. And that's all. Thank you. Okay. Just a clarification on the downtown area that we talked about ex extending. Is any of that property currently owned by the city? I believe that there was, right? Yes. I'll go back to that map. Uh, the, the, all the stuff that we own south of the tracks is in mm -hmm. that area, right? The little stuff that that block we own north of um, the church on uh, on Second is in that area. So yes, w some of that is owned by city. <coughs> go back to it. Whoop! I guess it's back a few slides here. Yeah, showed it. I think the other one shows it too, Paul. <laughs> I think you went by it. I think, I think you went by it. Did I? Yeah. You know, and actually, don't no, we have don't an inventory so. list? There yeah, an inventory That's what I was thinking. I thought that was part of that inventory list. There is a area. big yeah. inventory I list. I think it was the one right. of the of the down. It had you. Had, there it is. There it is. There you go. It's a long presentation. I know. There's 59 slides. <laughs> <laughs> it's this thick. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Whenever somebody has a question. So which pieces of are city owned there? Uh, the stuff on the other side of the tracks, you know, in the, in the and There's the stuff on the north side of the tracks, too. In the yeah. little block on the north side and of the tracks. And on 2nd yes. Street? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I was talking about, you know, on the other side of the tracks, I thought we had several. Yes. Well, the, you've got the Shaughnessy House, you've got the Mission, you've got all that property that's Correct. south of those two pieces of property, plus all the park, plus the... And you have east of there, too. Plus east you have of the, 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 the Knock Center there with the dog... And, and we have the, um, the auditorium. Animal control. Is in there. Mm -hmm. You can see we went north of Florence, too. I didn't talk about that. So this would be in the downtown auditorium. Yeah, the auditorium. Right. Right, and I, I was thinking more on the other other side of the track. But okay, thank you. We own the, all that blighted stuff down there. It's getting better, though, I will say. New road, too. Yeah. Mr. Powell's keeping us on track on that. Mr. Powell, yeah. you wanted to say something. Well, I, Lisa had ladies oh. before gentlemen. Go ahead, Lisa. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I just wanted, you know, I mean, I know it was a long presentation, but, you know, Paul, I just... I'm just so impressed how you really pull in everything that we've discussed for over the years. And, you know, I know we only do this every 10 years, and we talk about a lot, and I, I'm, I'm pleased with, the, you know, the strategic plan that the city council put together because I can see he's incorporated a lot of that into this. Or not he, but, but the committee, and I right. know, Mayor, you're involved too, and, and Dick. Um, but, you know, of course, I, you know, love the, you know, the expansion of the, commercial and industrial areas. It just seemed to flow perfectly. The housing options I'm, I'm super excited about. I just think it's something that we really need. And um, we've been talking about it for so long. And I think as we look into the future with the growth, that's that's where it's going. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, people are looking for those options. So I was really excited to see that. Um, transit needs, I'm, I'm glad you did incorporate where we are and you know, you know what we can do in the future. And, and solar. Um, I was glad that, that he put solar in there. That's such a big thing the, these days. So um, <clears throat> I just appreciate all the hard work. I know I've been to some of the community meetings and people were really excited to, to um, take part of this and, and give their input. And so it's um, so nice for us to get this final product. I know there's so much work that goes into it, but uh, I know it's not totally final yet, but, um, but I just, I really um, enjoyed and, and look forward to to you know where you were the final product here so thank you for everything thank you mr bell well <clears throat> your committee's done a good job you've got a good leader and uh i don't know about the chairperson but uh <laughs> the uh what what there's several areas that i i just think were kind of nevite uh water we do not have enough water we do not have enough. If you'll look at what Arizona water's getting there, there's pumping it out of the ground. They're getting the groundwater right now all over town. The uh, water's a big issue, and I'll just mention this. The uh, plan that, that I had had 
and, and some others had presented on harvesting the flood water from the Mississippi River. That passed unanimously except for one vote in the, in the, uh, in the, the Congress or the House at, at the state level. It had to go then to the Senate and then here came the, the pandemic. Everybody left, nothing happened. So we're gonna to try to go after that again right after the first of the year because the, you, you know that would put it so much water uh, in here and, uh, and, and it's surface water, as, as you say, is the best kind of water to have. Uh, the, uh, so it, as I say, I think the water uh, deal is, is tenuous, but uh, if we can get some, uh, some water coming this direction, uh, one of the interesting things was uh, uh, Tom, my buddy, Lucero. Oh, Tom Turin? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He, he thinks that's a great idea. And he said, my God, it's just common sense. And, and uh, you're taking the flooding, you're mitigating their flood damage they get every year, and you're bringing water down. So uh, I think water is going to continue until we get... Uh, a way to bring in more water to be a problem. Uh, I think one of the words I like the best about the housing is compatible because all of us get heat when you build something that's not compatible next to somebody else's and they just don't like it. Uh, I think the compatibility is a big issue and, and uh, it, it, you know, when you do a puzzle, most of the pieces around it look kind of the same. And I think when you're doing your job, it's kind of that way. You have to pick areas where everything around it is kind of the same. So uh, I think that was a really good thing to bring in. Uh, the downtown, uh, the downtown's not gonna go anywhere until we do something. Uh, one of the big opportunities we missed was when the, when the uh, at work building uh, was vacant. We should have gone in there and done some things to, to bring people downtown. I, I met with Richard and, and uh, with uh, the lady the, from uh, Main Street and she, Holly, she, uh, she said there's nothing here for kids or any, anyone else. Why would people come down here? They don't. Mm -hmm. there's not, it's not a walkable area. Nobody walks down there. And, and so I think that until we can figure out some way now, one of the things we talked about is the new uh, the new Circle K's are pretty nice, and if we had one of those in the downtown, there's there's one around the corner, but you got to have a bodyguard with you to go. Yeah, in. It's two pumps and a little about. scary, but uh, beyond that, it's an hour or an hour. It's a mile trip to get gas for people. And, and that, and the food and the other things, that's something that would bring in people on a daily basis. That's what we need. The, uh, the uh, I think, you know, the, the downtown is like a, a, a big uh, mall, a big area without any anchor tenants. There's, there's, there's about two restaurants or three that, that people go to and then and then the bashes, but we really need to work on trying to get some people in there. One of the other things is, is I don't know, Walgreens goes back and forth, but it would be a, a nice place for a Walgreens building downtown where people could use it and it's uh, available. And those kind of things, I think Richard's gonna meet again. And then we drove across and looked at the south side and uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna take uh, a ride uh, there is aware of it in a van and go through the south side. The road really just, I can't tell you how much better it looks with that nice, beautiful pavement there. And, and then it, it will extend in all the way down to ash, which ash in the road's good from there on out. Uh, we're, we're not that far away from where a lot of people might want to live that are working out and, and uh, the things that are going along on, on yeah, on the road there on Thornton Road, and and uh, so it, as I say, I think that uh, I think you guys have done a great job, and and uh, the the one thing I, I don't understand is is I eleven I uh, 
I know there's people said it's really dangerous to stay away from it and others that say, you know, you're really missing the boat by not trying to get it uh, laid out. Mayor, you probably know more than than most about that, I guess, but uh, I-11 is something that really would be helpful for us, that's for sure, and-, and uh, It's still coming. What's that? It's still coming. Yeah, but when? And where, no, that's, no, that's the biggest, that's the biggest question is where? That'll be the $2 billion yeah. question. Well, that's, as I say, I think, you know, those are the kind of things, I know the thing that made Casa Grande really jump out was, was I-10. And I, for, for some of us that lived here when that was going on, they had one that was out where I-10 is, one that was in closer, one that was out by Francisco Grandi, right. the different routes Montgomery, that would come yeah. through. Coolidge did not want to have it. They did not, they weren't interested in that kind of traffic. So that, that we were kind of even pretty much with a lot of uh, the population in Coolidge at that point in time. And that really shot us up by having that availability of, of I-10 and so I just hope that we uh, can figure out how to get I-11 uh, more interest in that. Uh, and as I say, the south side, I think there's a lot of opportunity over there once you get it cleaned up. And as you go and look, the city's one of the biggest <laughs> problems is, it, and it's just, it has, it has storage areas that, that need to be uh, screened or whatever. Uh, but as I say, that's I think we'll get a chance to go look at that, and I thank you, and I thank our, our lady uh, that has Leslie. I thank you uh, for the job you've done, and John, I help. I'm glad that you keep them straight. Bob, do you have a comment? Yeah, actually, very similar to Mr. Powell's. I had, I had a comment on the water. We we seem like we're projecting out our growth, and stating that we believe we've got <coughs> adequate water based on uh, certificates of assured water, but, but it also states in the plan that Pinal AMA uh, has stated that we're 8 million acre feet short of those certificates. No. And that no more certificates will no, be no. issued. There's, there's certificates and then there's, um, then you have analyses. So there's two different things there and what when you're talking about that eight million acre feet that includes the analyses and the analyses have no right to water right now so okay. so don't go don't get the two of them confused the, the certificates of assured water are are in that number but okay if you took all I'm the analyses sure out if you took all the analyses out you uh -huh. would actually not you would not be short any water that like that amount of water you're talking about basically is related to what at the end of 100 years, 100 years. is what would be left. And I, I challenge anybody to come okay. anywhere and, and near I guess that's what I'm saying. Is yeah, that what's going to happen in 100 years. Yeah. And, and, and I, I know a lot of states exactly what have, have shortened it in the, the time frame on the water. California has. And, and but my, my, point, my point was going to be is that, that that's a pretty fragile uh, estimate for us to base our future on. I'm not saying it needs to be changed or anything. I'm just saying that seems like it's a moving target and that over the next 10 years, and ultimately, my question is, is there a chance that the uh, process for getting uh, certificates issued and maybe even maintained will change? So to answer your question, I think the first thing you need to think about is that, and you've heard this phrase before, paper water versus wet water. Mm -hmm. So paper water is your certificate. It means you have the legal right to build a subdivision because the ADWR has already given it to you. Whether or not there's really surf, um, you know, groundwater to support that, wet water to support that, that's a huge debate. And people are all over the place arguing about that. So <clears throat> this plan chose, chooses not to get into that debate and just says, look, there's legal right for 21,000 lots that have these certificates. Uh, many of those lots are in preliminary plats. You saw those. So if it's a final plat, then you get to build it, no questions asked. If it's a preliminary plat and you want to modify the design, ADWR reserves the right to review that to see if they're going to allow you to transfer your approved certificate to your new preliminary plat. And they have some guidelines, and that is a little bit of a moving target because uh, ADWR is thinking about their position. You know, they started say no change or very little change. They've moved off that. We've had one plat in Casa Grande. Uh, they had a preliminary plat make a fairly significant change to, to their street design, and ADWR allowed that transfer to occur. No more lots. It was a you know zero sum game 
with, uh, with a number of lots, but there was change to the street design. So that's still under kind of uh, evolving, if you will, what kind of change you can make to your preliminary plat. Okay. It's an ADWR rule. Uh, but for right now, these certificates are legal documents that okay. can be implemented. So, so we, we are pretty certain they're not going to issue any new ones, at least not anytime soon. That's I would say that's correct. a good bet. And are well, we are we pretty confident that they're not going to revoke any as well? I don't think they can legally revoke their right. issued certificates. That's a legal question. And city well, attorney and, could and talk about that, but it, I don't think so. Well, and if, and if could, I can, Mr. We could, mayor, we could spend a week talking about well, water. And, so and we're going we're yeah, to spend a fair amount of time. Yeah. I think the, the mayor and council and, and I, and what and I Bob, want those watching to, uh, to to realize and recognize is that we have a companion study that's underway in our water resources plan yeah. that is really working in somewhat of a lockstep from a timing perspective with our general plan. We anticipated that water was going to be a key um, element that was discussed as part of our general plan. And so, quite honestly, the mayor and council will see uh, at least the first um, phase of the water uh, demand, demand management system, which is our conservation plan at our next study session. The Arizona Water, we've been partnering with them on this on this plan. The, they will be here to present that. We, we were going to originally start with our with developing a strategy for water acquisition for, for bringing wet water back into the Pinal AMA. Yeah. But because of the interest of conservation and as you look at this general plan, the, the emphasis on conservation in this general plan, we thought that we would bring conservation first and it's likely <coughs> that the mayor and council will, will see the next several components of the water resources plan and early in the new calendar year but the primary emphasis is gonna be on our water um, acquisition strategy at that time. But okay. that, that document and those planning efforts are underway concurrently with this general plan process. Okay. And Bob, I'd be what happy to sit down with you and go over a bunch of that, all that water stuff if you want. Okay. To help you understand. And one of the I things that's really hurting us is all of the plats, final plats that are out there have obligations removed from the aquifer even though they're not using them. They may not use uh -huh. them for 10 or 20 years, yeah. uh -huh. but that yeah. doesn't let you use it because there's not a left enough water. And, and that's what uh, is, is really been brought up. We, I brought it up when we had, were up at, at the Capitol is, is that uh, there should be a, a, some kind of a, you can have it for so long and if you don't use it, you lose it right. Right. as far as your water because that, if you took, there's a lot of water that's, that uh, will never happen, these ones that won't get built, but they've got that tied up in the aquifer so the others can use it. Okay, what? any other questions, Bob? My other comment was on downtown. I, I love that it's been uh, so, somewhat uh, defined and that, that we can apply uh, different, uh, tools. different tools and elements to that. I, I had one comment uh, that I, I think, as a, as a council, we need to address safety and security, mm -hmm. not because of reality, but because of perception. And I, I think uh, eventually we're going to have to bite the bullet and come up with a plan. I have no idea what that's going to look like. I've, I've kind of thought about uh, closed circuit TV cameras and maybe park ranger level eyes and ears that patrol the area. Um, but I think we've, I think we've got to uh, get rid of that perception that, that it's not safe down there. Um, yeah. we, we all know there's a population that, that frequents uh, the downtown area and, and I think we've got to convince <coughs> people that they're safe uh, down there before we're gonna see any um, development and activity. Just, just my two cents. Okay. Thank you. All right, since everybody's had a chance to say something, it's my turn, and then we'll take a break, and we'll start the council meeting probably at about five after. Uh, but I just want to say thank you, Paul, for all your, your work and staff's work, because I think you guys have done a, an excellent job. I've been involved in it all, all the way along. And Leslie, thank you to you and uh, Plan It, um, and your, your work on this has been um, outstanding as well. So. Yes, and, and recognizing John also is on our committee, and yeah, Mike's also on the committee. So there's several of us here that have been in all the meetings, and uh, I think it's uh, 
it's work well well done, well uh, well put together. And I know we've got even electric vehicle pieces in here. We've got water conservation. Uh, we've got dense, mixed density uses. So I think it's a really, really good plan. I think it'll be good for the city for the, at least for the next 10 years. And then we'll, uh, we'll obviously going to have to address the water issue, which we are going to bring to council. So you're going to see a, a water resource plan that we are going to bring forward, which should help, um, I think, make everybody a little more comfortable in terms of where we're going uh, with our future water needs. Obviously, long term, Mr. Powell's ideas uh, are, are something obviously that the state needs to look at, but that's a, that's a much bigger picture than uh, for the city of Casa Grande. Um, anyway, that's all I have. And I, if you all don't have any more comments, I'm going to say thank you, Paul. Thank you, Mayor. Thank and, you. Uh, thank we'll you. take thank a break you. and we'll adjourn. Is five minutes enough, you guys? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll start at 7.05. <laughs>